Hey everybody, welcome to RoboHub. So this year I got a chance to go to CBPR and while I was there, I was listening to a presentation by Benjamin Rossman. Benjamin Rossman is also referred to as Benji. He's the co-founder of an initiative called Deep Learning Indaba. And Deep Learning Indaba is a company that's based in South Africa. And every year they host uh, events across the continent of Africa. They pick a different country and they help to sponsor all the experts in machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence from across the continent to travel to that event and form some of these social community bonds. Um, I was really moved by this. So here is a spotlight on Benjamin Rossman and the deep learning in Daba. I was actually born in Zimbabwe. Uh, my family's no way. from, yeah, my family's from Ethiopia. And so when I saw the, your presentation, your keynote presentation on um, doing deep learning in Daba, um, connected communities in Africa um, that are not, that don't have this type of society that's built for them. I really wanted to actually reach out to you and um, just have you explain what this is. Right, so maybe give a bit of the history. We, a, a group of us who are African and have um, mainly spent time studying overseas and many people working overseas, um, you know, we, we know each other at that point, about 2017, it's quite a small community. And we we're discussing that, you know, there's really not a lot of representation from the continent at these conferences. We particularly looked at NeurIPS being the flagship machine learning conference. Yeah. And we were not aware of any representation that had ever come from an African institution. And obviously, all proudly waving the flags and representing the continent, we thought this was not a great state of affairs. And reflecting on it, I think, you know, there's a lot of really smart people across the continent. And firstly, we don't know who they all are. We know our alma maters and the universities we work with. But the fact that the community doesn't even know each other is the first problem. And then, you know, that, that there's no critical mass anywhere that, you know, it might be someone interested in dabbling over here or there or working with um, Jupyter notebooks they find online or something. And so we wanted to see who there was, bring people together, and we thought, let's have a, a week-long summer school, maybe we'll find, or a workshop at that point, maybe we'll find a couple dozen people, we're aiming 30 to 40 people who would be interested in attending, and, you know, a few of us will give some talks, and we opened this up for um, people to apply and ended up with something like 750 applicants yeah. from all over the continent, and we thought, okay, wow, there's, there's something here. And there's yeah, an first appetite. Off, did you even like reach 750? That means you must have reached way more than that. At that point, it was like a word of mouth thing. So, you know, we, we all had our own connections and we'd reach out and say, hey, we're doing this thing. Can you pass this on and slowly try and propagate through the network? And then we reflected on it afterwards and said, okay, we don't seem to have any reach here or there. Maybe we can ask for connections. Yeah. And then subsequently, we put together a mailing list, which was MLDS Africa. Um, and that's given us now a way to broadcast out when things are happening. And obviously, since the events happen, we've now got all the social media presence. And now it's becoming easier. But, you know, at the beginning, actually, in our first report after the event, we had like the last few pages, we just had a list of the people we knew, kind of categorized by institutions and countries and so on. And, it, you know, we could fit that on a few pages. And now it's now I, like it's, it's a huge community. Yeah. And so for all the people who applied to it, what has been the thing that drew them to, to go? Because they're, they're having to fly across multiple countries. Um, and, you know, depending on what country they're in, it's not necessarily easy to travel to. I think your first one was in South Africa. Yeah, the first two were in South Africa. Next yeah. one was in Kenya. And now we're going to Tunisia this year, uh -huh. um, which I guess is the other extreme. And, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few things. One, that for many people, they'd never had the opportunity to be at an event like this. Well, there they hadn't been events like this. And even in, say, South Africa, where I think we've got the biggest community of people working in the kind of tech space. Well, when I say tech space, I mean mainly in research. Um, yeah. And again, our focus was largely in machine learning, although trying to reach out. But that seemed to be the common point that would um, attract most people. But for people, this is really expensive. So yeah. we spend a lot of effort in trying to raise funding and the bulk of our funding to actually fly people over because um, that is a huge thing but for many people like they'd be working in isolation so a lot of our 
applications. We'd have these stories that people have written up about what they do. And, you know, let's say I'm interested in reinforcement learning and I've been, you know, I've watched all these videos and read these papers and implemented this stuff. And we'd look at it and go like, wow, some of us haven't even done that. And, but this person says, you know, there's nothing like this at my university. I want to do projects in this and no one can supervise me. And, yeah. and I just feel so isolated. And we get this from every corner of the continent. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that's a big draw. Um, yeah. But as I say, even people that were at well-established universities that had machine learning groups, they tended to be small and, like, disconnected from the community. And so I think that was a huge um, incentive for people. But we always had these stories of people writing to us. We obviously couldn't fund everybody. Um, I think the first year we funded about 70 students completely. <clears throat> it's free for students that are accepted to attend. But like the funding would include flights and accommodation and so on. Um, but we'd still have people that would email us from a place like Ethiopia and say, yeah. you know, they're so excited to have been accepted, but like a ticket to South Africa costs three times my father's salary. And yeah. these kind of things were completely heartbreaking but you know there, there was this passion so we realized early on that what was important is the knowledge dissemination so we've got this culture of any of the um, lectures would film would put them on YouTube um, a lot of the tutorial materials we'd um, you would make available online as well we'd encourage people to go back and spread stuff to the communities in fact now with our application processes we've got questions around how will you further disseminate this to your local community yeah. and like that's become a core principle because we can really only take a certain amount of people at a week-long summer school yeah. um, you know capacity is limited but yeah. we want this to reach as many people as possible ultimately it's a one-week program and then the real value that you bring is what you do the other 51 weeks of the year so it's like exactly going back and then they're taking these connections and now they just have something that's a little bit stronger. Exactly. And actually one of the core components, because we've launched a whole lot of other programs around this. We, we try and experiment a lot with the way we do yeah. things. And I think one of the most successful programs we've had is what we call the Indaba X. And this is, the idea was we had a little bit of money left over and we scraped together some of it. And we wanted to support events in other countries. Now it wasn't sustainable for us to organize these things and we don't know what the best thing for like the community in Namibia might be versus in Zimbabwe so we had this call for people to apply to host an event and we didn't really specify what needs to happen there um, and we had a whole lot of applications where there were multiple from one country this was a great opportunity to bring people together and say like hey did you know these other guys exist in your country yeah. but they would propose their own events and we'd give them some financial and a bit of marketing support and these ranged from like one day events to week long events. There were some that were subsequently being virtual and spaced out and like very interesting ways people yeah. look at this. And they range from about 30 attendees up to 300 attendees, but driven by that local community. And this is a really important way to extend that reach. So that's now been 30 plus countries that have hosted these events, ranging from Somalia and Sudan down to South Africa. Yeah. And that's exciting to see that this is happening everywhere. Country to country, it's not even the same. Cultures are super different. Languages are very different. Exactly. And there's a few languages that are overarching. You know, if we, we try and target like um, English, French, um, but then Arabic becomes a big thing. And, and you know, and then breaking down into to other local groups. But you, you find like the, the interests are different in different countries. So, for example, we've got a big research focus in South Africa. Obviously, there's other things that go on as well, but that's where there's a bit of a bias, whereas you look at, say, Kenya, for example, they've got a massive startup culture, and so the kinds of things they would want to discuss in an event are going to be different. And if you're coming from the outside, you, you don't know what this is, which was kind of the point of the Indaba in the first place, that you know, coming from, say, Europe or the US, you don't really know what's happening on the ground, and you, want, you really want it to relate to the people there. And this ranges from your theoretical research to more applied research. And now, like also with countries being at different stages of their um, development and adoption at a government level, in some places, policy discussions make a lot more sense than others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, speaking from personal experience, in Ethiopia, there isn't a very large amount of um, even software developers. The, the amount of jobs for it is also in correspondence with that. And then this is something that must change very drastically. So what's the way that people learn about deep learning when you don't have some of these uh, more fundamental and core um, building blocks as parts of the community 
universities locally already. So this is changing. We're, we're getting more happening at the universities, but actually one of the gaps we've noticed in our applications, one of the weak points is usually um, academic faculty. And that's something that we need to change. And I think a lot of these younger students that are really passionate about it, hopefully will start going into some of those roles. Um, also, a lot of people that now have maybe their undergraduate or masters, um, through the networks we've established are now able to go and maybe do a PhD abroad and many are interested in coming back or, or go and intern somewhere and then come back. And I think there really is a strong drive to do this and I think this will start changing things over time. But in terms of how people are getting access to the content, one is online. There's just insane amounts of really good material online and that's, that's been critical. And then there's other initiatives. So there's a, a group, Data Science Nigeria, that we work with quite a lot as the Indaba. And their idea is to build up the AI community in Nigeria. And part of what they'd done was basically distributing flash disks with like just a ton of material on everything from some of these online lectures to uh, materials on getting going with TensorFlow or PyTorch and like distributing this to their local community even when there's maybe limited access to the internet. So people are coming up with some quite um, innovative solutions to the problem. Yeah, is that something that uh, you guys are also thinking of doing, just being able to give these, give these different communities like, hey, here's a list of 10 resources that you should keep your eye out on? Because even if your university is not necessarily keeping you up to speed, you can keep yourself up to date with the latest. So I think the big thing that we're pushing is the community effect, that like, you should know people that you can talk to. And you know, a few examples of this. One, I've had a few students that from Sudan, um, and in their fourth year of study, they had the, their research project, and they got a hold of me, and we'd met at the Indaba or something, and said, um, you know, we don't have, we've got great local support and supervisors, but people that don't really have this experience. Um, and so, you know, I got involved in co-supervising some projects there, and some of them were even around doing um, deep RL on simulated robotic arms and there were all sorts of issues with compute and uh, there's even sanctions on their country so it makes a lot of these things difficult but some of them have now written papers from their fourth year projects which is just super cool. So having that connection means they can now reach outside of their country um, to get some guidance which I don't think there were any avenues for people to do this before. And then there's other sorts of initiatives and the, the one I like to talk about is Masakane. So this started from some people meeting up at the Indaba that were interested in natural language processing and particularly on African languages. There's lots of interesting aspects of this. There's about 2,000 languages in Africa and many are under-resourced. So you can't just train your models um, you know, fairly naively and translating from one to the other. Um, and this started up as a kind of loose collective and they started having weekly meetings and now they've got this really active Discord and they've been churning out papers at a lot of big conferences because there's like these unique aspects to their problems. And so there, if anyone's interested in NLP in Africa and they find out about this, they just join this collective. And so there's these networks that are forming on more specialist topics now, the similar things happening, happening in the healthcare space. Um, and that gives people the access to whatever technologies they want as well. So besides natural language processing, are there any other things that you saw like a unique take on that, um, that that's very uh, unique to the African communities? So a couple of things come to mind. One is that obviously there's a, a big agricultural focus. And so we've seen a lot of um, projects. So during the Indaba, we typically have a post a day, African research day, where we encourage all the attendees, particularly the students to bring posters and present them and have discussions. And actually there's usually some phenomenal work that's presented there. Um, but a lot of the focus is around agricultural applications. Um, and, and something I thought was really exciting was things like a smartphone app that you can take a picture of a cassava plant that's got some disease and diagnose it. And you know, useful tools like this for farmers. And these are like unique plants to um, those farmlands. Yeah, exactly. And so this kind of thing of like tools to help local farmers that are maybe even just subsistence farmers, um, you know, inject some intelligence and the, effectively your machine crowdsourcing to help them do what they're doing better. So there's these kinds of applications. There's a lot of applications around things like malaria, tracking where, what areas are becoming more or less prevalent. Um, 
So there's some things on malaria, which connects into healthcare in general. Um, we've got these big issues across the continent where you've got a lot of like really good expertise, but it's very centralized in cities. And so if you're in a rural community, there, there's all sorts of challenges. So a person might go to a local clinic to get um, diagnosed for something, some tests get taken. This takes a few days to work its way back to a big pathology lab in you know, the nearest main city, which may be hundreds of kilometers away. And then there could have been something that was an urgent um, problem that needed to be dealt with, but in some cases it's too late. And so, you know, applying different kinds of machine intelligence to kind of shorten that time frame. And then there's other sorts of problems like logistics challenges. You've got yeah. a lot of little farmers in an area. Can you develop techniques for them to bring their produce together to get to lower logistics costs yeah. and maybe um, have a, a stronger bargaining force in getting good pricing for your products? Like yeah. These kinds of challenges, which I, I, many of them, I'm sure, exist in other places, but it's not a, a priority that people look at. There's a series of different environment settings that, that change like whether or not a product is viable. So, like, um, cost of labor is much lower. So that has a big effect, like whether or not you want to like automate certain things. Actually, that's a big thing, right? It's, yeah. it's not a very compelling story to say we're automating this process so that humans don't have to do it. And when you're sitting yeah. with some countries with like. 30 plus percent unemployment, like that's not going down well, but yeah. there's many jobs that are very dangerous. There's conditions that are causing loss of life and so on. And these are problems we need to look at. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel it's important not to just say, we've got these technologies developed in the West and we're going to use them to exactly. solve African problems. By the same token, like we're doing some of the fundamental research as well and being an active part in the community. Cause I think yeah. it's important to have that like two way exchange of ideas. And that's starting to grow up as well. Yeah, what you see a lot is that a, the, a lot of the technologies that are made, say, in the U.S. are not necessarily adopted um, it, across the continent as a whole because they don't really fit those user requirements. Like exactly. Phones is a big example. Most of the phones made there are um, either locally made or made with firms that are specifically making it for um, those societies. Yeah, and what's super interesting is that there are a lot of smartphones. There's a huge smartphone penetration across Africa which means you get to think about these kinds of apps, but other kinds of infrastructure aren't there. And so, as, yeah. you, as you said, like you can't just take technologies developed elsewhere and apply them directly. There's the differences in everything from language to what the, the roads look like. Autonomous vehicles, for example, the roads are very different. You um, plug in some standard off the shelf, like object recognition, and firstly they struggle, the lighting conditions are different, and then the, the kind of constructions culture. exactly like <laughs> completely different yeah. and and even like you look at the structure and we had like in, in some parts of the one city we we're doing this in the buildings are built in a very particular brick way and the software is just identifying every building as a prison <laughs> right so there, there's like these kinds of challenges that require some local adaptation and yeah. thinking about it are there big players in industry that are very impactful and do you partner with them through Indaba? So it's, I, I think it's in quite an early stage and there's a few different kinds of things. From the Indaba's perspective, we originally would say go to all the big tech companies for support and they've been amazingly supportive actually. Um, but we didn't want to give this impression that, oh, just if you want to be in this field, all the exciting things are off continent. Um, there's more and more happening with um, the startup scene. So like the early ones there were machine learning consultancies and, and that sort of thing. And there's, there's quite a lot of that happening. Then a lot of the banks and the big corporates on the continent, some of the telecoms companies are being quite innovative. And that's where a lot of people are working and they're starting to support the community more and more because they realize that they need to up their game if they want to attract um, talent. But you know, there, there's not much in the way of big companies. There's some stuff happening in the drone space because that's you know huge areas of land that you might need to monitor or keep track of crops or cattle or something like that. But really, these things are just starting to develop. You know, some of these smartphone type technologies might spin out into small companies, but nothing that's a, a huge player in the space. Awesome, thank you. Great, thanks so much.